Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Palmetto Cats Live. See everybody in chat. What's going on, everybody? All right, guys, I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, I was thinking about a unique show to do. And, you know, after, you, after you've done a lot of things, you see other shows, you got pretty much a, everybody's been interviewed and all this. I'm thinking, well, okay, so maybe a, not a unique idea, but let's talk about something that's coming up hopefully down here is the fall season and with the fall season typically comes fall cat fishing big cat fishing and there's some different techniques and strategies or places that they might hide that we might need to talk about and i decided that i would ask the person who basically wrote the book on how to do all this stuff mr timothy catfish tim scott of epic catfish and he's down in the basement we're going to get him up here in just a second i uh, just want to thank tim for bringing him up for for agreeing to come on uh, we we all love him let's make sure that we share it out that way his uh awesome and important advice and information gets shared to as many people as possible you can help out with that by clicking the thumbs up and sharing it out on your community page if you have one or on social media or just copying the link and, uh, you know, sending it to whoever. But without further ado, I'm going to welcome him up. Tim, how's it going, man? You got a nice sunset back there, looking comfortable on your new handmade couch. Oh, you're muted now. We See, we, we worked this out all before the show, and now <laughs> that's the beauty of live streaming. Nope, I can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, there, oh, oh, I think we're getting somewhere. Hang on. Can you? Nope. All right. Hold on one second, guys. Technical difficulties. All right, I got you now, Tim. All right, buddy. <laughs> That's the beauty of live streaming, man. So let me ask you again. You got a nice sunset behind you and yeah. a beautiful new couch. You built that couch, right? I did. The wife and I went to stores and we could not believe the price they wanted for couches that just sit outdoors. So I bought some cushions and I built the couch. What, what kind of wood did you use? Well, I used uh, white pine as well as some treated uh, six by sixes and stuff like that. But I put the, uh, the really nice UV resistant uh, finish that I've done the rest of my uh, outdoor living space in and it's, it's done really well you know when you did that youtube short or tiktok earlier to, it was either today or yesterday i think it was yesterday and you talked about laying on your couch you know send me your videos and you kind of pan to your feet and the and the patio and everything like you're like a white mr miyagi <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, got all, you got all the hand-built stuff out there and yeah, uh, you know, I, I would say besides catfishing, because catfishing is really my first love. Right. Uh, woodworking is my second design, yeah. uh, you know, inter and, you know, just 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 being able to take certain things and textures and, you know, joinery and, and, and making it really work. Old materials, new age materials, all kinds of stuff. Now, we didn't come in here to talk about this, but I'm just, you know, it's a nice icebreaker. Now, because you've had so much experience, do you like just build from up here or do you have like a set of plans like that you used to have or do you get on the no. Internet like most people? Uh, no, I don't do any. I, I really don't uh, look at anybody else's stuff for even inspiration because I'm a firm believer in original works, original ideas, things like that. So, uh, you know, but but I have developed my craft over you know, 30, 40 years. I do draw some plans. But like what you see out here was all done by sight. You know, oh, wow. It, 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 it was interesting because I wasn't exactly sure what materials I was going to use. I didn't know how big my pillars were going to be, you know, because I, I don't really, you know, do like a regular engineer and say, well, it's, it's got to be, you know, uh, 14 by 14 or whatever. Uh, so it was a little bit difficult to do to, I suppose, to, to make the county happy and get my building permit exact size. I said, uh, 
I don't know how many square feet my deck's going to be. It's all going to go by site, you know, because it's all going to be proportionally uh, correct. You know, I didn't know exactly how far I was going out until I kind of, you know, started into it. And uh, I didn't know how high it was going to be because I wasn't sure if I was going to come down off a of major uh, stairs because my front door sits about, sits almost five feet high off of the, you know, off the ground. Oh, so okay. I build this deck like way up. It's like, it's like up, up to here, you know, at, at, the, at this part. And there's not really a whole bunch of uh, gradients. Uh, but you know, neither here nor there. Uh, you know, th- there was some pretty cool stuff that I, I think it's awesome, with. man. Thank you. Thank like you. when I try to build by side, I end up throwing everything away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm the guy that because so what one project I'm thinking about doing is uh, building out my truck bed so that we can camp in there and have drawers under it and everything. Okay. And I've I've downloaded the plan. I've I've like searched hundreds of youtube videos and and then downloaded plans and everything like that and uh i'm hoping that when i finally get to do it when the price of lumber isn't skyrocketed uh that i can you know take those plans and actually make something of it without destroying all the wood nice nice yeah you know that's what a guy's got to hope you know, yeah hey that's all that's all that's all you need sometimes don't, don't scrap all the wood but well hey so I don't know what it's for. Go ahead. The kids and I, we don't have a lot of field stone rocks in in the middle of Illinois. All of them were basically carried in from the glaciers and deposited in certain places. And so the kids, the kids and I, uh, we we saved field stone that would rise up out of the field in just one little section for like ten years to build the six field stone pillars that we've got wow. in the house. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was it was a long process, you know. Uh, we took a, a 900 square feet house and, and made it into a 4,200 square feet with a thousand square feet of deck space and uh, three por- porches, which one is uh, like 24 by 36. So you I'm are the white Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wax, wax on, on wax off. off. Yeah. So you need to get Sean over there and he can be your uh, your uh, car washer and your deck sander. And- <laughs> <laughs> Sean comes over and he usually just uh, uh, fixes himself a couple drinks and makes us all laugh. <laughs> hey, that's that's worth its weight in gold it too. Is, it is. <laughs> all right. Well, we came to talk about catfishing, and I don't know about the weather where you are. It's probably a little nicer. I'm getting a lot of popping for some reason. Oh, it's probably my terrible uh, internet. <laughs> so, um, the weather here is really hot. And uh, here. it's not hot there. No, matter of fact, it's it, it, it's getting down into the 50s at night here. Holy cow. And that's not unusual. Even though we're not that much far north of, of like even you. I mean, we're probably, we're three hours uh, south of Chicago. But we have that prevailing westerly wind that comes out of Canada, scoops down in the middle of the country, and goes back up about New York. And see, you guys out on the coast have that residual because that it's like current in the river so it's going this way and it pulls in a lot of weather off of the off the you know the atlantic ocean Mm. it comes in and a lot of people are pretty surprised because we're basically straight west of uh the uh pretty much the james river and and you know whenever i see stan i'm like stan it's winter time and you guys got 70 degrees and you know we got 32 yeah <laughs> and Stan's like how is that and i'm like yeah well, there it goes so yeah that's as that's as loud as tim's gonna get guys you have to lean in and right, listen I'll, and jack I'll your get, volume I'll up. Get a little bit closer how about that? <laughs> well the, down here it was still 90 today okay. um and that popping is killing me though hmm. let's see if we can fix it real quick all right Check, check. All right, maybe that. Nope, it's worse now. <laughs> All right, well, we're we're gonna keep on going, and guys, just sorry about the popping. I could probably leave and come back. Is that in all right? Let's thing? let's try that, and I'll try to keep everybody entertained. <laughs> well, guys, you know that's the 
that's the beauty of live streaming and anybody who knows tim knows that he has that uh that special internet and uh we're just glad that he's here tonight so what we're going to talk about so you can get your notebooks ready we're going to talk about the transition to fall catfishing uh mainly like what the fish do like where are the fish going and uh, obviously he's going to be talking about this but where the fish go and uh, what they're looking for uh should we change up our bait should we change up our tackle you know and then and then what kind of strategy should we use uh once that fall kicks in so as soon as we get this this scenario situated that's what we're going to be talking about all right let's see i don't hear any popping do you tim just a little bit on your end but it's oh man you're coming in crystal clear all right so when we get to this uh fall catfishing what do you think the the temperature of the water is when fish start moving to that fall feeding pattern or or whatever it is that they do okay so let's uh let's actually step back a little let's step back you yeah. you do you because it's not necessarily what is going on with the the water temperature or even the air temperature that that clicks catfish kind of into that fall transition mode and fall transition to me i, I like to uh classify it as a whole different time period it, it's a small it's a smaller window but you've got you've got basically pre-fall mm -hmm. which which means you could call it late summer as well a lot of people right. call it the dog days of, of, of summer but what's happening is a lot of the big fish have moved further away from their shallower water haunts if you get what i mean so you get that early summer and you get a lot of people catching fish in that mid range that 20 25 15 even 10 foot of water but as that summer progresses right before fall when the nights start cooling off a little bit more but it's basically uh it's based off the amount of, of, of sunlight just like pre-spawn is and just like wintering is it's that trigger because we could have weird weather but they still need to be closer to the areas that they're going to do their fall thing and then their winter thing. So it's not that they're necessarily uh, moved all the way to a wintering hole situation, right, but they right. will start inhabiting deeper water. You know, summertime, 25, 30 foot, when you've, when you've got availability of 60, 70, 80 foot hole, a lot of times those 60, 70, 80 feet are empty until about, oh maybe a month or so right before we expect that fall thing to start happening now i don't know about the rest of the country but even two weeks before uh, labor day weekend where i fish they start moving kind of off of that mid-range and that shallower stuff and they start you know kind of habitating in those deeper uh, that even if there's no current, they won't be there. But if there's heavy current, they definitely will be in deeper, slower areas. Whereas in the in the in the hard summer, they're looking for current more than they're looking for depth. Now, so let me ask you this though, because you said two weeks before Labor Day, yeah. and then you know the, the Labor Day is next week. Um, for us. Uh, if you can't, so you're going off Labor Day for your area. Yeah. So yeah. obviously you're in the 50s at night. Yep. We're in the 80s yep. at night. Yep. So can you kind of relate that to like sure. a temperature or a region? Sure. Okay. No, I, 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 I can tell you that the catfish calendar is different with every two degrees of, of longitude by two to four weeks. So you guys are approximately two degrees south of us and so you could expect my timeline to happen within two two weeks to a month later because you guys won't start getting basically generally chilly at night for about another month and it won't be as chilly if we're as lucky we yeah if you're lucky <laughs> but still it'll still be that 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 transition period because and and I, i'm saying trends i mean there's there's always going to be your anomaly you know, where, you know, somebody says, hey, I caught a bunch of fish in 20, 20 foot of water. But most likely it was adjacent to an area that they liked. Like, And that's like a good right point. Now, like we're not talking in absolutes, guys. Right. We're talking in 
trends, what yeah. Tim has seen over the years. Yep. And so, like, right now, if I – let's just say uh, somebody asked me, hey, would you be in a channel cat tournament on the Illinois River right now? I know exactly what to do. I know exactly where they're at because it's like clockwork. Go to the general deep areas, set up on the sh shallow sand flats, cast out shallow – cast out medium and cast out deep and see where they're hanging out so if, if you can see where there's a zone that they're hanging out say they're hanging out in 14 to 20 foot of water well then i know you know if i do a couple of stops like that i know i gotta find more 14 to 20 foot of water because i'm gonna spread it out from five six all the way to 10 to 15 to 20 25 30 40 and i'll find that range and that's what they start doing in the fall now you know that from experience yeah. but yeah. but now that you, you know, you've obviously patterned them over the years. Yeah. What do you see happening with the water and air temperature or bait or whatever that makes that those fish do that? Nothing. Nothing. Only, only low, only stable, you know, fairly stable, low, normal water. It's, it's, it's less about temperature and more about a, amount of daylight. Because okay. like clockwork, like I, I could say, okay, if I'm going to be in a tournament, I know that I'm going to go and catch probably, if it's a five fish limit on channel cats, I know I'm going to catch probably an average of 10 pounds a piece. And it's going to be somewhere around with a five fish uh, uh, thing. It's going to be somewhere about around 50 pounds. And I haven't even fished that river for 10 years, but I, I already know it. W one thing is I have people call me and they say, Hey, but that is a variable though. The, the length of day. Yeah. yeah That's kind of what I'm looking at is yeah. like, you know, for somebody who hadn't patterned them, what should yeah. they be looking for in your area? And the, so the length Absolutely. of day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Le le length of day, you know, and you can pretty much set your watch by in this middle region, you know, in this, now, not all the way to the coast on e either side, but in the middle heartland, you know, I don't think it reaches as far as Tennessee, but two weeks before Labor Day, two weeks after, the general, the situation is you're going to start looking deeper to start amassing more fish. You're still going to find fish in other areas, but you're going to find some of the biggest fish and you can find bigger numbers in some deeper water. Gotcha. All right. So we got the kind of the timeline down. So you're, you're because we're two degrees South, I'm just going to kind of sum yeah. it up. Uh, my, and I'm in South Carolina for anybody who's, who's listening and doesn't know. So I can probably expect that trend to start about a month after you're experiencing yeah yeah any any time from now until about 30 days it, that trend is going to start happening and it's going to be up to you to kind of notice it and you're going to notice it by saying okay I, I i traditionally catch fish here last month and where did they go well then you start looking at the you know at the deeper basins and the drops and things that you know deeper water that has still decent current some of that deeper water, when the when the water's low, like it is this time of year in rivers, uh, you know, sometimes they don't hold any fish. You're going to have to go to the edges of it, the front edge, the front lip, you know, where, where it's shallower and then starts to dip down, or the edge mm. here. But sometimes they're just running around in that basin. You know, it could be it could be 60, 70 feet deep, but yet the fish are tucked over where it rises on the side ledge, uh, 50 or 60, but then tomorrow they might just be loosely hanging out in that 50 60 70 80 feet you know the tennessee river is a lot like that too it's one of the few rivers that you know is a classic situation like that where you know during during spring you're going to find them shallower you're going to find them you know in that harder current and then as summer comes you're still going to be finding them in that but yet their uh, habitat kind of gets a lot more diverse and then as fall transition happens their habitat shrinks again and so then you, that's, and it's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of magazines really kind of propagate the myth of the fall feed bag. You, if you're a catfisherman, you've heard it. Mm -hmm. It's actually a myth. They don't eat more. It's just that they're more available in bigger numbers. And they generally start Makes sense. To eat during the day a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, in, especially in the fall transition, you may find three days, four days, five days out of the month where the bite's on, on during the day. And it's crazy. I mean, uh, the kids and I went, you know, a couple of years ago and made some videos out of that. And that was the only couple of days that entire month. And that was generally what I call the fall transition. It's, it's the 
fall before the fall. You know, it, it, it's still warm, but the nights are getting chillier. You're wearing jackets at night. Uh, it's a couple weeks, you know, one or two weeks before, uh, you know, uh, Labor Day. And, uh, man, sometimes the, the bite is on during the day and completely off at night. And then it'll switch around. Like it may be like that three days a month or, you know, three days that week and then switch right around. So you, you got to kind of fish both to figure out what's going on. But man, when that bite sh is hot during the day, it's usually mm -hmm. terrible at night or the other way around. If it's terrible during the day, it's usually a hot bite at night. So that was one of my questions. It's like, you know, a lot of people do a lot of night fishing in the summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically just because of the heat, but also because they tend to feed in the shallower water at night um absolutely and, and in case they feed in the deeper water as well because we oh, okay. have such deep water bait fish right you know, and a lot of people say you know if you read on almost any article for the last 30 years find a deep hole set up above it get to the shallow flats and throw your baits out stuff like that it doesn't really work that consistently like mm -hmm. uh, on the mississippi where i fish those giant fish don't seem to leave very often that threshold is about 25 30 foot i've i spent years trying to target them in 15 to 20 25 feet of water right next to that and that only worked during the the actual fall period where they're coming out of that deep water even at night because if you watch my lives you'll notice that we basically are fishing some of the deepest zones that we can get our hands on and they don't have to leave i mark all kinds of deep water bait fish which in in our situation are a, a moon eye, uh, a mm -hmm. gold eye. Moon eye and gold eye don't like light. They're deep water fish. Uh, we only have access to them like underneath barges where they can, you know, maintain. So before water. before we get to bait, yeah. though, I, yeah. I, I, so my question was is we do a lot of night fishing in the summer for obvious reasons yep. and some tactical reasons, as you just said. Is there is there a time or and I keep going to temperature because that's it's stuck in my head. Maybe I need to get it out. Right. A length of day, a time, or a season, or um, for you, what month? Should guys start transitioning to daytime fishing instead of doing the night stuff? Yeah. And you kind of answered that with the with the midday bite thing. But, I mean, is there a time where you should just say, hey, he's probably not going to be as good at night? Yeah, and – until the water temp and we can talk about water temperature about this because water temperature is a major trigger for a day bite okay so just like almost everybody knows in the winter time if you're winter cat fishing it's almost almost always better during the day than it is at night so i kind of uh, say what where i fish that mark is usually about 55 60 degrees now, if it falls sharply, I mean sharply, if it goes from like 78 degrees and falls sharply into 55, the water temperature now, if it falls sharply off into 60 or 55, that'll shock them for a bit. It, it'll be a terrible bite until they get acclimated to it. But once they do, generally speaking, it would be very common for it to switch over to a day bite. Now, you can still catch them at night. There's no doubt about it. But to be stubborn, I wouldn't be stubborn and say, we've got to continue to fish at night. Right. We would fish at night just to see how it's going because it's, it's, it isn't a guarantee. Just like right. almost nothing is a guarantee. In, in, yeah. In <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yep. And at the end of the day, no matter how, how many books or science you know, yep. it's still fishing. <laughs> it is. It, it's still fishing. But, but, but the one thing, mm. catfishing is so varied. And it has so many options that if you're like off the mark, if you're not over the target somewhere, you can run them up for days and zig when you should have zagged. And I say it all the time because, you know, I'm even prone to doing it. I get I get an idea in my head that I think. Well, that was I'm me last that. winter. Oh, yeah. I just couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I couldn't find them. Yeah. My biggest advice to everybody listening, including you, is try to stay over your target by knowing your fish's habits and their proclivities as to what happens normally. But always keep your mind open and look at every single anchor as an experiment. Okay. 
every anchor is an experiment. You have to try to listen to the fish. Now, hopefully, they're going to tell you something. There's only one way. Either they're going to bite or they're not. You've got to at least get on fish that are biting to see what their activity level is, what their propensity for taking the rods down and say, okay, I, I'm, I'm in this zone, and I know that there's fish here, but they're not doing it. So I've got to change my stars, and i got to move around until I find mm. a, a different pattern. Because pattern A that I thought was going to work may work, but just sort of. You know, and, and a lot of people are like, wow, you know, you saw three or two or four big fish right there. Yeah, but somewhere there's going to be a great bite. Now, I don't always get on a great bite, but when I do, it's not usually right off the bat. It's it's after I've worked out some sort of equation that says, okay, this was okay. I found fish in there, but they're not doing it. They're just sort of half-heartedly taking the rods out. But then I change my location a little bit and go, oh, there it is. And, and you know, whether they're piecemeal in the bait or you know my wish when i'm watching youtube is that i would never hear about another gar bite <laughs> i knew it was coming oh yeah <laughs> because uh that seems to be the catch-all but hey I, thanks to thanks to you though yeah uh, and i guess it, i guess it was in a live stream he goes every why is every you said every why is every miss fish a gar yeah and i said you know what i'm i i never really thought about that but now I can identify a yeah. gar hitting yeah. versus a catfish hitting. Yeah. So, you know, and a gar, and just for those of you who want to know what I've identified, the gar will slam the pee out of the rod real quick. Yeah. And then almost, almost Im- immediately it'll come up. Yeah. Um, and not, no, no, not, that's not to say that it's always a gar doing that, but right. pretty much every time I've seen it do that, and sometimes the gar have hooked up, that's, you know, that was what was on the end of it. Yeah. Now, I, do, I don't have any... Uh, <laughs> That's so funny that you said that. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any criticism on gar bites in lakes because I would imagine it's pretty difficult to stay away from gar. It you is. Know, gar and catfish habitat in a lake mm-hmm. intersect. All right? But in a river, they shouldn't. Yeah. Okay? They, you have... Inter- in a river with current. Yeah. You have interim areas where gar and catfish habitat will overlap, but if you're if you're entertaining gar, you're in the to me, and this is kind of a blanket statement, but I kind of live by it. If I'm entertaining gar, I'm in the wrong spot. And honestly, you will you will not see epic catfish get a gar bite in any of the spots that we're in. <laughs> now I could go to. Uh, I could go to some rivers where the catfish and gar habitat are totally co-mingled. And, you know, you got giant five-foot gar, and they're hitting your shad, and they're hitting your live baits, and they're doing all that. <clears throat> but if you get your baits in the right spot, generally don't get messed with uh, by gar. Yeah. Yeah, generally, if I'm in the river and I get a gar, it's pretty much one spot that all it always happens to me. And it's, it's my favorite spot because it's – all cozy in the little nook and I can back oh. my boat in and mm-hmm. there's nobody out there, but there's not really much current there. But yeah, in the, when, in the lake, when I, used to, <clears throat> when I used to fish like that, I had gar bites. Yeah. And when, that's when the, to, that's the only I, time in the river that I get them. When I used to fish, uh, out of the sun, out of the wind, in the calm waters, the peaceful <laughs> looking, you know, and the gar love like that peaceful. stuff. Oh, they love that peaceful <laughs> water. You know, where, where, they where there's not much sun, and they know, just glide through, yeah. like, hey, what's yeah. going and on? And there's no boat traffic, no. And there's no giant waves, and there's no barges wanting to run you over. Gar but in the everywhere. lake, I, re- I remember a couple, it was over a month ago, myself and Bill were out there, and like, we just could we caught one, one decent catfish, and then every time, wham, pow, gone, wham. And we pulled a gar into, we got one gar. And so we moved. And then same thing, wham, 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 no hookups. Moved, wham, wham. And finally, we're just like, that's it. I mean, they chased us. It felt like they chased us to three different spots. Well, that's you crazy. found an active gar uh, population. Yeah. In hey, man, if, if if gar fishing ever becomes something people want to watch on YouTube, then I, I'm your man. You got it, huh? You got it. <laughs> All right, so get back to the catfish. Yeah. So we we've talked about um, you know, you possibly want to start moving off of that night bite, you know, once it's you know starts to cool down and you said the right, temperature. But let, the, let the fish prove it to you first. 
Yeah. Don't just go on a whim and say, well, you know, I think the night bite's over because I've done it before. And I said, okay, we, we, we've had colder temperatures at night now for about two weeks. I think it should be a complete day bite. And guess what? It wasn't yet. And, you know, I don't have a week every day anymore to test those. So I've, I've got to be over that target basically, I mean, from from the time we get on the river. Yeah, you fish like me. We got we we got we got one day. <laughs> yeah, but if I'm not, if I'm not right, I got to be willing to quickly change up. You know, I mean, if, if I'm, you know, hitting for the fences, you know, if I'm swinging low, I need to swing medium, then I need to swing high. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. Here you go. Since we kind of got that, barometric pressure and catfishing is a great subject to hit. Now, I'll go ahead and say my piece on this. Um, I respect that there may be a science for it, but it doesn't matter to me because if I can go fishing, I'm going. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you can tell me um, the science behind it that will help me when I go, even if the barometric pressure is not conducive to catching a lot of fish, what should I be looking for? So if everybody wants to know how barometric pressure affects fish, raise your hand. So that is one of the things that I studied back in, in college. And, and, and basically, it's a proven fact, and I could cite a whole bunch of stuff, but the principle is that water is an atmosphere like air. It has its own typical pressure. All right. Barometer, low pressure or high pressure, high pressure condenses the water. So it's almost like the water's getting lower. It's it trips the fight or flight mechanism in them. Okay. okay. So they start looking for safety more than they do food. Low pressure, on the other hand, also signals an alarm. Like ultimate high pressure and ultimate low pressure signals two alarms. And one with the ultimate low pressure is that generationally, this is one of the things that they understand through instincts. And it is that they may not get to feed again if they get a gully washer and it is, com I mean, complete flood. It becomes difficult. Not only is it difficult for us to target fish, it's also difficult for, for catfish to feed because all of a sudden now all of their bait fish aren't congregating anymore. They're willy nilly here and there and the other places. All of a sudden, you know, the pH is off. That's another thing we can talk about. So, I so I'm sorry, if the pressure is high. Yeah. Then the bait fish scatter? No. If the I water, missed that part. If the water is high. Okay. Okay. If yeah, yeah. The water that makes sense. Flood, it scatters bait fish. Right. They're right, right. not as easy to target. So it will trigger a response in, in large catfish and all catfish that if that if that barometric pressure is low, that signal storms coming. And mm. that will effectively turn a bite on. Because they gotta, you know, they gotta feed up. They they can't just, you know, hang around and you know eat eat one here and one there. They gotta they gotta you know, get with, it. and and uh, uh, so that is more of the theory that is behind the tiny bit of science that we have. Here's a good question: What are the ranges of the pressures so we know what's good pressure and what's not? You know, just like we were talking about, I'm not the guy that goes by numbers. I'm really a terrible, I'm an art guy. <laughs> and so I feel it. I know, you know, like okay. right now, right now, I'm not overly excited about it, but we have some pretty good low pressure. I feel like the bite would be pretty good based on 30 years of fishing in all sorts of conditions. This would be a pretty good consistent bite. Now, if, if we had a storm coming or staying off in the, in the distance, and it was like heavy, hot air with a really yeah. low pressure and all that. I've done really, really well on some really giant fish and numbers of them in that situation. Now, it's not always. It's, it's nothing is a shoe in, of course. Right. But, uh, you know, because I've actually blanked on days like that where, for some odd reason, I was not fishing the appropriate spots for that kind of condition. You know, not blanked on anything over 70 or anything over 80 that, i call that blank sometimes 
You know, if you catch a bunch of 40s and 50s, I'm like, oh, geez, we got destroyed. Calm down so, with that kind of fish talk. You're making people I, feel I bad. I know, I know, but <laughs> I, I, can, I can only speak for myself. Because you fished the Mississippi River. We get it. Well, yeah, and, and other places, you know, like uh, when I was younger, I mean, shoot, I, I went to the Tennessee. I went to all kinds. I mean, I fished the Rock River a lot. I fished the Fox. I fished, you know, the Wapsie and the this and the that and the other. Oh. I mean, there was no limit to where I was going. Is it? What's up? Oh, frozen. I don't know if it's just me or Kevin. All right, we back. All right, I I, I never left according. No, to I life. think it was I think it was my internet that time. I'm oh, not sure. Yeah. Maybe maybe Anna cranked up a TV show in the other room or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So is it true that if you have bluebird skies, that's high pressure? Yes. And and typically, yeah, it is storming here. You're right, Jeremy. That's probably what it was. Um, that's going to be a tough bite. But you have those weird one-offs where yeah. it's the best bite you've ever had, and you go, what in the heck? I fished 100 bluebird days, and it's never been any good. But this day, I caught more big fish in the middle of the day than I've ever caught before, and then go try to duplicate it, and it doesn't happen. I went out in January this year. And I had a specific video I was making. It was going to be a silent video, no talking, just all the ASMR sounds and whatever. I was like, man, if I could get, if I could get, you know, one or two fish minimum, I could make this happen. And man, I must have caught 10, 15 fish and there, was, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Yep. Not one. And somehow God shines on you once in a while and just says, Amen. You know, Here it comes. And Amen. I haven't been able to. That is one thing I have not been able to to figure out the conditions that fire up a bite on those weird those weird days. I don't, they're just and it keeps us coming back for more because if if we had it all figured out like the combination on a safe, you know, <laughs> twenty two right, thirty two left, fifty five right, well we'd get bored with it. But it still surprises me every now and again. Not all the time, but. Every now and again. Flash Extreme Fishing said, I've always skunked the day after a storm. I have not always skunked, but usually it's not as good. Yeah. And JTC said, I think the fish hold super tight to the wood or structure on them high pressure days. I would generally agree with that. I would because, you know, anytime I'm on a high pressure day that I have done consistently well it's tight to cover especially flat edge you know i don't ever notice blues being overly tight to cover they seem generally looser than flat edge by a comfortable margin uh big channel cats will get real tight to cover too i mean especially in the free farm they'll be right in the tree you know right in that rock line but but blues you know i used to fish blue cat water for flat heads and for big channel cats it tight to cover and the current was enough i was close enough to deep water i should have caught a lot more uh big blues than, than i ever did it just didn't really happen how close so are you to davenport there. iowa i am one hour to davenport and oh yes i have fished the cedar the wapsi the skunk the iowa pretty much every major tributary the the wisconsin uh you know uh, uh, uh shoot I can't even remember them all, but pretty much every major tributary from pretty much the border of Minnesota all the way down to about St. Louis, as well as the as the main pool, until I figured out that uh, the big lake pool was going to take a lot more uh, research and effort to get on the kind of quality fish that I wanted. So I started skipping those more. Right. You know, uh, uh, the Canton pool, the... Winfield pool, all that stuff, you know, the, the big honking, big pleasure boat where the main river's 40, 50 foot deep and it goes for miles. And then the backwaters are so extensive. It's not impossible. If I lived on it, I would master it, but I can't do it in a weekend or I can't usually do it in a weekend. I would if I had to, but I have a choice. I can go to a river, riverine stretch and be jackpot in the first, you know, 40 minutes. Usually if I wanted to go ahead and start fishing. Now, I right. don't, for a live, I don't just start fishing. 
I will look for two to three hours at wow, general, two to three hours. Yeah, at general areas, and and it'll it'll take a big long gambit. I mean, it'll be launch the boat, lock through, go down, look at spot number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, all the way up to spot number ten, and now I will rate them one to five. If you're past five, I won't even think about you. Anymore. <laughs> but one to five, and that's what I want to do. And then maybe I'm seeing more and bigger fish in one area, but I'll rank it number two anyway. Because number two is a resting spot instead of a feeding zone. So I'll go to number one, which doesn't have as many big fish. And, and, and I'll try to set up on that. If you guys couldn't tell, I try to land a good fish within like the first 20 minutes. So there was a good question, um, and I'm kind of curious myself. Does the pressure affect fish more on a lake or a river, or is it the same? Commensurate. I, I think it's probably the same. And you know, I did forget this one detail, and and I think everybody should know it, but you can't always assume that. The apparatus that really, really deals with the pressure is the swim bladder. Now, okay. swim bladder is a very sensitive little instrument. And it, just like uh, in nature, they all, oftentimes, uh, you know, organs do two to three things. You know, you don't often have uh, one organ that does just one thing. But a swim bladder does two or three things. It controls buoyancy. It's almost like a submarine. Like the submarine will, like, uh, take its ballast down or up to become more buoyant or, or not. It can control that. Uh, it also helps it detect sound, believe it or not, because like the lateral line is, is filled with these gelatinous pores that accept sound waves that come into it. But once it hits hard on that swim bladder, it actually, it is, uh, uh, it's a secondary, but just as important link to the neural, the, the, the whole neural system. So it, it really reinforces the fact that of what kind of sound it is. It, 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 is, it is very interesting. But when the pressure mm -hmm. starts building up on it, it mm -hmm. feels the pressure because it actually gets squeezed. Like, uh, uh, well, and, and this doesn't make sense because uh, that much, because, because I'm equating a mammal to a fish, but uh, like a, uh, a sperm whale, its entire rib cage will collapse down to almost nothing when it goes two to four feet down to go feeding i mean it just its lungs collapse everything collapsed like down to almost nothing because of the pressure mm. well the same thing with the uh with the swim bladder when they go into deep water it compresses really hard and that's why it blows way up when you reel them up quickly out of 50 foot or more water shoot i've i've had them have trouble with swim bladder after 30 foot of water, but yeah, our river isn't that deep. So, yeah. um, so to relate back to the fall transition, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that there's more low pressure days in the fall than in the summer. Is that correct to assume? Because you, you know, yeah. mostly yeah. you have that fall type weather, the, yeah. Yeah. So is that yeah, does that have any like bearing on why the fishing gets better yeah, in the yeah. fall? Absolutely, absolutely it does because their 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 window of acceptability on feeding is open a lot more. You know, it because if your bite window is really short like it is in the winter and in the hard summer, if your bite window shut, you know, if you get those days that are low pressure, uh, you know, it's it's the fall, it's kind of a cooling trend. Uh, they're kind of, you know, moving around a little bit more. Yeah, it, it can really uh, lead to really good days. Awesome. Just people talking about some of their people giving some advice to Stan know. says uh, he's uh, he was talking about something earlier with moon phases. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And I see a bunch of questions, guys. I just want to get the ones that kind of pertain to. All right. So he see Stan says he believes there's lots of. Of different variables, some positive and some negative. And the more positive, the better the bite for more active catfish. More negative, obviously, less catfish. And then he said, talking about moon phases. So he kind of went into what those variables were. 
so so Stan just threw math into my science. <laughs> no fractions. I was told there'd be no math. No. And Ricky said, so the best thing to do is have a captain's log. Yeah. And really experience by time and and uh, experience by time on the water is going to be the best answer for pressure and moon phases. I think yeah. that's the best. I mean, that's that's going to be the best for anything is time on the water. Now, but that's the, that's something that's very delicate and precious. If now, there's anyone out there that is actually thinking about doing a captain's law, one of the most important things isn't necessarily the barometer reading or the hard science facts. A lot of times it's, it's, it's how the air feels. It's, it's how the water's moving, how, you know, where the wind's coming from. You know, it, it's, it's basically the, the overall feeling. And then once you start looking at it, once you start comparing a lot of days that are similar, you know, it was hot early, it was a little bit whatever, and then the rain came and, you know, whatnot. And, you know, it, it, it was light and airy and the clouds were puffy and whatever. But once you, once you can start, you know, okay, and, and that's putting math into your science again, uh, you say, okay, this happened 13 days out of these days. It's probably the most common uh, good day, and you start to get a handle on it. Yeah, uh, Steve, we're just uh, his micro. I have a microphone, and he doesn't. So what I've done is I've backed away from mine a little bit to kind of sound more like Epic so that you can turn your sound up if you need to. Hopefully that works. If not, best we're going to do tonight. We're having lots of difficulties, but we're making it through, baby. We got 107 people watching. Thank you. Make sure you hit the thumbs up. And um, and then also, uh, while you're here, while I'm talking about it, don't forget Epic Catfish's link is in the description. So you can go check out a bunch of awesome videos um, and live streams that Epic and Sean and his family have done over the over the couple, past couple of years. And then, yeah. of course, Jeep's talking about moon pies. <laughs> <laughs> moon All right. phase. Let's talk about moon phase. <laughs> moon phase. Go ahead. And But before you do, yeah, I got to yeah. say thank you to Freddy's Outdoor Adventures. Boom, boom, boom. Ten bucks. Nice, he said, Freddy. great info. Love listening to the professor. Awesome. I call him Timothy Catfish. Okay. So, uh, moon phase. Moon phase. Go. Moon phase is probably the most, probably the least quantifiable out of all of the, uh, all of the situations that you can have. Because the moon phase is, of course, nearly different every single day okay so to be able to quantify that you have to go back to the the same moon phase 30 days later okay mm. that's very difficult because all of a sudden in that amount of 30 days that whole catfish uh scenario are you paused kevin no i'm not okay you are a little bit but that's fine we can still hear you so as far as a uh, uh, uh Kind of a to be able to do a complete study group on that is nearly impossible it would it would take absolute decades and then you'd have to match the water conditions so just like stan said you've got certain conditions that are not favorable and certain conditions that are favorable the only thing that i can tell you is that once that moon when it's close to being full shines on the water over the trees usually my bike goes to complete crap <coughs> and it doesn't matter if it's blue or channel cats, and I say usually, I've done okay on full moons, and I've caught some really big fish on full, full moons, but as a general rule, the bite can be on, 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 and then as soon as that sun rises, I mean the moon, it just kind of cuts it off, and I mean, and that, that may be more superstition than it is science, but uh, I cannot remember ever thinking, man, I can't wait till the moon crosses the trees because we're going to you know do really well fair enough fair enough uh i think we're having so many so it's storming here everybody in chat just want to let everybody know we have rain and thunder and all kinds of stuff so if it goes in and out don't worry we'll be back and then you know tim's got the best internet in the world so <laughs> kevin you're sounding like you are sounding like ava off a of wall Ava off of what? It it was a kid's movie. 
back okay. in the day. <laughs> but, uh, nope, I think I'm going to have to leave and come back in. Okay. All right, well, while, while Tim's doing that, we'll just kind of say hello to people. Captain Morgan's in the house. Parker Pursuits has been in. Boy Troy Creole. Lance, Freddy's Outdoor Adventures. Uncle Jeep with the comedy always won't fish without the moon out. Werewolf? There's Ryan setting hooks and crossing eyes. What's up, man? So if you're just coming in, we're here with uh, Tim Scott, Epic Catfishing. And he's educating us about fall trans transitioning to the fall catfishing season. And uh, so we're hoping that he can get back in here and we can finish up this conversation. <clears throat> and Maurice says, I have the best time fish catfishing on a full moon. Okay. And then uh, our flash extreme fishing. Are you going to the Cabela's King Cat next weekend? Yeah, the September 10th. I'll, I'll be there. I won't be fishing it, but I'll be there. All right. Can you hear me now? You good? Epic Catfish, are you good? Hmm. Nope. All right, well, let's try it. Check, check. One, two. Hmm. So we can hear him, but he can't hear us. <laughs> hey, no, let, me try, let me try to go in the house. Maybe it's my connection. Check, check. Can you hear me now? Oh, nope. Look. All right. It was real nice out here. Outside. I know. It's possible that my Wi-Fi is not really. Hey, y'all, while he's moving in, if you want to tell me, am I lagging any? Is uh, is everything uh, is on my side? Is it looking fine? Sounding good? All right. How is it now, I can hear you fine. Can't hear you. You can't hear me? Nope. Mm. Check, check. Hey, everybody said I'm good, Kevin. <laughs> hmm. It's probably my signal. All right. That's better now. Check, check. You can hear me? Yes. I just okay. had to catch up with you. That's all. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. So, all right, so we went through a bunch of different things that I didn't think we were going to go through, but that's awesome. You know, talking about barometric pressure and moon phase. Now, the biggest question I have about fall catfishing okay. is I've been told it's a myth. I've been told it's the truth. It, I've been told it depends on where you're at. Um as you know, as we transition from fall and then even into winter, does bait size and hook size have anything to do with hookup ratio? Should you should you change baits? Should you do anything with baits and hooks as far as size is concerned? Now, I can't really tell anybody what to do on their water, but on mine and wherever I've fished, which isn't just my local water. I mean, I've got a pretty good five state range that I've fished in you know cooler periods of water. Once that water hits about 55 degrees, I don't use those gigantic donkey baits anymore. I start using stuff that's, you know, palatable to a fish that I think isn't that well, which I know in colder water, 55 degrees, they have a much slower digestion. They don't need to eat as much. They're not big goblins. You know, if you, if, if you want to feed a catfish as much as you can ever feed one, just run its temperature up. Run, run that temperature up to 85, 87, 88 degrees, and then all of a sudden they've got they can't they can't hardly eat enough food to sustain their own weight. But turn the temperature down, they'll eat, and the, the turn it down to 55 and even lower, like say 36, 37 degrees. Their digestion is so slow that they'll be. Everybody says, "Oh, look, they've been eating so much." Well, they have, but it's over a bigger window of time. So just imagine if you started eating stones, Kevin, and <laughs> your, your stomach started filling up over, or, or something like cartilage that was really hard to digest, bones, say a bunch of chicken bones. Well, and you ate a chicken bone, and, and that chicken bone wasn't digesting, digesting, and it wasn't going through your system. Well, 
you're still going to get kind of hungry or kind of bored, one of the two. And if you eat more chicken bones, pretty soon you get a distended stomach, you can barely fit anything in. So since your system's so slow, you only are going to eat. I mean, you're not going to eat a whole, you know, uh, a pizza hut, pan pizza if, if you're if you're all, you know, full all the time. So I try to give them something that's uh, a little bit more easily digested for one and a little bit more easily palatable. Yeah, that makes sense. And I've heard that before. Yeah. And then I've and, also and heard. It proves, it, it proves itself on the water. That's the thing. I mean, theory is one thing. You know, science theory is another, you know, biological stuff and blah, blah, blah. But it's got to prove itself on the water. And it has for me for many years. Right. And I, I, I get that and it makes total sense. And um, I've tried it and it's worked and then I've tried it and it's not worked. So yeah. I haven't been fishing nearly for catfish as long as you have. But, so. but, but, but that, that's okay, Kevin. One mm -hmm. of the things that you guys all, everybody that's on the coast, mm -hmm. you guys have, uh, you don't get as severe weather as far as cold that right. we do. So you guys in your cold water is more like us in our warm trends mm -hmm. and the fish are fairly active in our warm trends but when it gets cold where the water temperature is 33 degrees 32 degrees you got ice forming you got you know ice in the mornings and whatever it can be a very difficult bite but you let it warm up for three four days even five to seven degrees and all of a sudden here comes the good bite yeah, and that's kind of what I was told. Uh, I mentioned it to, to Steve. Uh, you know, I've gotten to know Steve a lot over the past couple of years. And he said, you fish Shanty Cooper area, right? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, you should never use small bait. He said, always use big baits. You probably, said, okay. he's, he's, he's probably right. And so I, I've, I started using, I don't use any small bait. Unless I, and I know you're probably going to roll your eyes at me. But you've seen me catch a big fish on chicken. Oh yeah. If I'm using chicken, then I'll I'll use a smaller piece. But but you know, we we catch the bluegill in the river and we just chop off a little bit of their tail and or use them live. Well I don't I don't know about you, Kevin, but chicken's four dollars a pound where I live. Yeah. Chicken is no longer the yeah. the uh the cheap the bait. No, <laughs> That's right. It's not. I'll pay four dollars for uh a tube of crickets and go catch twenty five bluegill. Right. right. <laughs> No, you got that right. I mean, we can't even find chicken breasts here. Oh, wow. And it, well, not in the Walmart. So is, if you go is to that like, because all the cat fishermen are using it, I guess I think so. It's causing a it run on chicken. Yeah, and and so there was a comment earlier. It said, it said, um, fall cat uh, transition to fall catfish. Does that mean switching from cherry Kool Aid to raspberry Kool Aid? <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to use lime Kool Aid, lime green. <laughs> <laughs> Lime green is where it's at. Lime you better green, the master it's himself. Chartreuse. <laughs> Chartreuse. Got to mix it with lemon. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, chicken breast. Like it's like, I uh, shoot. I bought it for twenty two dollars for a whole pack one one day at Publix because I didn't have any other place to go. Nobody yeah. else had it. But anyway, twenty two dollars uh, for like a three pound pack. Yeah. Oh my! It was crazy, man. Well, so, I, I remember when, when we thought $8 was high for a three-pound pack. Right. Mm. All right. So, sorry. I, I thought you were going to keep going so I took a drink. Um, all right. So, we talked about, you know, fishing deeper waters, going into fall. Um, any Anything we should know about, and I, I kind of already know the answer, but like terminal tackle, like what? What kind of rig should you think about using? Um, or is there anything that you change to line selection, hooks? Uh, and I and I know I'm getting fancy on that one. But I'm just curious. You know, some people may have some kind of, you know, like you've been fishing for a long time. Maybe you've just, you got this thing that always works or you always do it now. You know, th there is a few things. I've got some problem with my meal here now. Uh, there is something that always works, and that is trying to match the tackle with the available fishery, the available size fish I've got. Because, you know, I don't go into like a power plant lake, even though there's big blues in there. I don't go in there with a, you know, a circle hook 
this big. I, you know, I use this stuff in the big monster waters during the time that I can expect to run into them. Because all I'll do with this is eliminate catching fish. Now, sometimes for me, that's okay because, you know, I'm, you know, dinosaur monster hunter. But if I'm wanting to, especially if I'm wanting to take somebody that hasn't fished very much and I want to get them on action, I'm going to get something like a five or a seven on circle hook instead of, you know, a 12 to 18 or a 16 on circle hook and a big, you know, giant catcher's mitt sized piece of bait. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use something smaller, something more palatable and a, a, a thinner wire hook, uh, more limber rod. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a lot of work to do this monster hunt thing. Not many people really, you know, once they go, really, really like it because the rods are heavy, the weights are ridiculous, the baits are horrible, and there's blood flying all over the boat. I mean, Sean gets it in his face all the time on his hats. You know, I get it and we get slimed all over and, you know, all that stuff. We, we just like it because we're kind of rough characters like that. But, you know, if, if I was taking a regular client, you know, just out of all my client base, there's only five, six, seven percent of my client base that would actually enjoy going down there and going through that kind of paces. They, they, they really like a nice day where you're catching five to 25 pound fish and you're catching lots of them. You're slinging, you know, nice, nice little baits, you know, something that you can hold in the palm of your hand, uh, you know, and just being busy. I mean, they, they love it. And, and, you know, it's kind of a, a rare thing. So I, I try not to, you know, just try to we're, we're more like a sideshow, if you get what I mean. You know, when, when we go out monster hunting, it, it's you can live vicariously through us because, you know, we're the ones with the sore backs the next day and bumps and bruises and the teeth knocked out and, you know, the, the <laughs> dents in the boat and, you know, it's slamming up against everything the whole time, you know, and maybe, maybe, maybe you know, it's tossing us to and fro all the time. Uh, you know, and, and we, we, we got to carry baits that are like this long and, you know, hack them up with a, you know. A, a well, I think, or, and, you know, to talk, about, to talk about your YouTube channel and your live streams, I think the appeal to watching you guys fish live as opposed to someone like me, you know, I could say I'm going to hunt for monsters, but it'll be like, you know, if I catch one that's a monster, it's like a one in a million type thing on a live stream. But yeah. you guys have found the place and the section of river, and you've studied enough, you've fished enough to yeah. know where those guys are. So you actually have a solid chance and do often catch monsters. Yes, sir. And we that's what we intend to do every time, whether we're on a live or not. You know, you guys will be surprised. We actually do fish some that we don't film at all. We might take a few pictures. We might, and sometimes we wish we would have. <laughs> because you know you're like oh we're gonna take a break this time and we're not gonna film it we're not gonna you know go that's when the anything. that's when the monster hits and then, then then you end up hitting the monster but but luckily lately we've actually you know had some really i mean we've had 70s 80s hundreds you know lots of 50s and 40s and some you know good old-fashioned 20 25s and 30s on our lives but the last time we went with jerry for some reason that bike was difficult and Yes, it was a full moon, and and we're not saying Jerry's bad luck. No, Jerry's not bad luck. <laughs> but I did not expect that bite to be that bad because conditions seemed right, everything looked pretty good. We were marking some fish, but we couldn't mark fish in a patternable location. They were spread out, one here, one there, and I don't know about you guys, I don't really love anchoring on one blue cat that once I anchor might leave in three seconds. You know what I'm saying? I got 200 feet of anchor rope out, 40 pound anchor. It, it it takes a lot of effort to anchor. So I like to see two or three good fish, and I like to see them in a in a position that I feel comfortable that they're going that they're staying there long enough that they're going to get up and feed. That's what I really want to do, especially on a lot. But you know, spot lock on the Mississippi where I'm at. Uh, I know a lot of guys that try it, and they say it's terrible. You know, yeah, I, I was know. just thinking they'll never make a trolling motor. You know, they do actually make a motor, a spot lock motor for, for where you fish. It's called a, a 9.9 Evan Root. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> With a tiller on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just put it, just hook it to the front of the boat and put it in reverse 
Yeah. And it's in full throttle. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, but to get back to this fall to winter transition, lighten up the rods. If you're used to using big stuff, if you're, you know, if you're used to using like a good old ugly stick, kind of, kind of a stout medium action, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe some ancient Mariner reels that are what I, what I hear, they're about the size of a Garcia 6,500, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I used to use Garcia 6,500s all the time, even when I was landing monster, but a Garcia 6,500 is like trying to shoot a bear with a 22. It doesn't work that good, and it, you're in for a long, long haul, and you're probably going to lose some fish. So I kind of went up to the big, the big dumb saltwater-looking coffee can reels and all that, and they, they're not a pleasure to, to, to cast. They're okay to reel in, but, I mean, the whole rig is just ridiculously heavy. You know, yeah. and, and luckily, I've got some newer age rods that people have, have gotten for me. I mean, uh, the Mad Cat's rod is great, but it's, it's a little lightweight. I mean, for what we do, and it's the heavy. Now, I'm not saying it won't handle it, but it's just, you know, it, the rods I've got have a more sensitive upper tip, and it, they don't hardly bow after that third. The Mad Cats will bow about halfway in the middle, and there's nothing wrong with that because I don't know of too many people that are fishing that deep of swift current with gigantic fish with mouths like that big. Uh, so I think for 99% of the population that fishes catfish and even big ones, say like the Tennessee, I think the Mad Cat rod is spot on. I mean, it's a lot friendlier to cast. It's built really good, you know, and, and uh, uh, but like e even even the rods that I have now, no one makes them anymore. <clears throat> what are they? They are uh, surge rods. They were like, you know, mm. yeah, okay, I remember. Original. And they were made for the Mississippi River in the area that I fished. They were made by some guys that fished down there. And they had them at the bait shop. And I luckily, I mean, I bought enough to use. And I'll tell you what, I beat the holy bejeez out of them. And uh, You would think there. that one of these, you know, the rod companies that are, I mean, they're getting into YouTubers now. You know, I mean, yep. they should see what you guys do and, and make a rod that will support that kind of. I know, but I, I you know, it's a. If they look at the, the demographics and who's going to buy that thing, you'd buy, you know, I mean, some people have um, big stuff, you know, big saltwater rigs, but they, they basically have it for a conversation piece. You know, would you use it? I wouldn't use the rods I use for blues on flatheads anyway. No way. I, I would hate those for flatheads. You know, I'd get them out. I'd to break the glass. In the event of war, when August comes and I get ready to go chase some donkeys down in the big water, I mean, that, that's it. Otherwise, they sit in the rack. You know, I'll use lighter weight stuff, especially in the channel cat season, especially in the flatter season. That'd be a great video, like right before the summer season kicked off. Like, you guys, it's time, you know, in your voice to bring yeah. it out. And then we like, you have to yeah. like, oh. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> yep. So, all right. So we've covered a lot, and we're you know we're running over an hour. What is something? What's a, a mistake or top mistakes that you see people do during a transition? Not even the transition, but in the fall. That you know you'd like to you have answers for correct. Well, I can't really uh, talk about what I think anybody else's mistakes are, but I'll, I'll tell you some that I've made. Fair enough. I have done... I've tried to fish too deep of water. Because a lot of times when they're in that deep water, especially the deepest water that's there, when the water's low, there's almost no current down there. All right? So they're not interested in eating. I could mark school buses down there in 80 foot of water sometimes, and I'll get so excited. John, I'll be like, oh, my God. And we yank her up and, we, you know, throw 250 yards of, of, uh, or feet of, of anchor rope, and we, we, we can triangulate, and we throw out, and we wonder why we don't get bit. Because they're sitting there like this. They're sitting on the bottom. You know, just say my uh, 
my, my, my flag is, they're, they're just sitting there, you know, or maybe they're just sort of hovering like they do at Bass Pro. And it drives me nuts. It drives me absolutely crazy to know that there's a five-foot fish right there. I mean, I can see it He's right there. And he won't eat. Makes me want to sit on for days. But I've done that before, and it hardly ever pays off. Because who knows whether they're going to eventually move down over. Are they necessarily going to move up? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, could I uh, get my, um, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking it'd be rather difficult to, in 80 foot of water on the Mississippi, to spot lock or control drift and put one directly in front of its face when your cone in 80 feet is more than 60 feet wide. I mean, I would need like a camera down there on a thing where I could just feed it down. I, I, I can try to pinpoint them in 80 foot, but it is a lot more difficult than even 40 foot. I think you just got to get lucky. I know, but I, just, I don't have time to be lucky. I got to be good. I hear you. And so that's, that's my next thing is like, I think the biggest mistake I made is make is time on a spot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't ever, I can't tell you the last time I marked a particular fish like you're talking about and then anchored on them and stayed there and tried to catch him. Because a lot of the guys up here, they'll say, yeah, I marked the fish, catch it and move on. Um, but especially in the river, like I, I fish where fish should be. Well, you know, or, or you know, where I've learned. And then I, I sometimes make the mistake of I'm sitting there and I'm like, dang, it's already been an hour. You know, I should have moved. But I'm getting better. I'm using spot that spot lock. I can do it in my river. And it's a lot easier to make the decision to move when you don't have to pull it in. Darn right it is. When you just push a button, yeah. let's go. That, Reel yeah, them up. That, let's that, go. That's got a, a certain luxury to it. Yeah. But let, let's, let's discuss another thing that – and I'm only going to talk about it from my perspective because I don't say anybody's wrong. But I have chosen to ignore the side view function on, on my hummingbird. Really? Okay? Because I cannot tell. Well, maybe other people are better at it than I am. But I cannot tell what species the fish is. I can't tell how high off the bottom he is. I know if he's off the bottom or on the bottom. But, but I, I can't tell you how high they are. Like, it, like if I got it set 80 feet to the right, and a lot of times the bank where, 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 where I'm going to be, I'm within 80 feet of the bank usually on most of the spots that I fish. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's 250 yards. But, uh, and I'm marking what I think are big fish underneath barges or, you know, whatever. It just never seems that I, I, I just – it just never seems to pay off for me. Now, I'm going to keep trying it, but when I'm on a live, I generally kind of ignore that. So what I do is, is I will actually run the boat over them, memorize the grid in my head about where that fish is to make sure that fish and this fish and this fish, to make sure that my anchor, I can target all three of those fish on that same anchor. So I can present baits to more than one fish. Because one fish, you might be a little off here, you might be a little off there. And sometimes I'll actually go to the side of big fish. So that I can target, use the current to bring my baits in line with that fish. Because they're, they're almost impossible to hit right in front of the bait. Because they're, you know, it's not telling you on down scan versus even side scan exactly where that fish is. It's not saying that it's... It's right over the moat, you know, right underneath the motor. It's not saying that it's four feet over here. So I got to kind of triangulate that boat. And if you guys watch my lives, you'll know it. Because I'll move into fish, I'll, and I'll move back into fish. I'll go forward over them, and I'll go back with them. So I can actually kind of pinpoint where that fish is, especially if he's a monster. Because I can be off three feet and never catch that fish. Especially if I'm a little farther, you know, downstream of it or a little too far off to the side. But there's been many times when you got you can't see the fish finder usually on a live because it's you know dark and it just kind of bleaches out. But there's been times I've marked two fish or three fish and we've caught all three or all two fish. And you can tell how big they were, move up, you go, there's no other fish there. 
that's the other thing. I, I wish everybody in their lives could see the lack of thick, actually. Because there aren't, everybody thinks that, you know, the Alton area, the Mississippi, just loaded. It's not. It's really not. I, I'll bet in four hours, I would probably have trouble marking 50 catfish in general. And sometimes it's only 10. Sometimes it's only 15. Now, I, I do kind of, I'm saying catfish that, that I'm interested in. Because I will turn my game down to where I don't even see fish under 20 pounds. You know, so, and that's another thing people can learn. If, if they really want to find big fish, you go over what you think are 5 to 10 pound fish, start moving your sensitivity down until they almost disappear. No, that's good. You that's good what, you're, what you're marking, and then turn it down even from there. Because I know what a, what a 50 pound fish looks like, or a 40 or a 20. If I mark, you know, enough of them and I go over them a couple times, and then I'll just start turning my game to up to where those will disappear because I don't even want to see a fish that's over 30 because what happens is I get two 30s that start going like they're next to each other, and they all of a sudden show up as a five-foot donkey fish, and then, then I feel stupid because, you know, I, I've tried to fish for the Leviathan that's this big 45-pound <laughs> fish. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. There was a question. Um, uh, Laughing Cat Fishing asked, what do you consider fall water temps to be? 55. I mean, that's a general consensus uh, on most of the biologists. That's how in fishermen came up with it. They didn't come up with it on their own. It, it was basically when the metive degrees, it's a, it's a major marker. Because above that, 58, 60, they seem to be quite a bit more active than they are at 55. Mm. So, you know, anywhere between 55 and 60 is generally that fall transition marker. Now, and, and that's another thing. It's very difficult, like for you, that you're a lake fisherman, are dealing, you could have a river right next to you that is going to be a different temperature because you know you don't have you, you know your fish finder doesn't have a, a little detector that goes all the way to the bottom because that stuff starts to stratify you know when when those cooler nights yes and it condenses and it starts to go down but it will be cooler water on top for a while before it totally turns over whereas a river it's it, it's going to have pockets of cooler water moving under the hot water and then it just sort of mixes and things like that so it's it's uh it that that water temperature is uh it's 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 kind of a kind of a catch twenty two, you know. And you hear people these days say that surface temperature is seventy four. At least they're doing that because they they get it that it's different. Yeah, than, you know, yeah our surface water. temperature is eighty three. Yeah, or or our, I, our, I haven't even been on the on the water for two weeks, and I'll guarantee ours ours isn't even close to that. I'll bet it's seventy five or less. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So, uh, and that, that's another. So, I was going to say uh, right before we wrap up, uh, chat, if you have any questions that I didn't um, read, uh, go ahead and type those in and we'll take your five minutes here to answer any questions you have. But uh, while they're doing that, that's another great point. So, how can you, uh, like, if your service temperature is 100 or 85 degrees, how do you know how, what, what, what's the degree change as you go deeper to where the fish are? That's going to depend on a lot of different factors. As a matter of fact, I like to think of water temperature as a trend. I like to pay attention to what happened three, four, five days before. Because if, if it just happened in one day and I got, you know, four inches of surface water, it's not really going to be that different mm, if I'm gotcha. on a lake. So if I know that we've had cool nights, 50, 55, 52, 48, da, 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 I can pretty much tell you that it's going to be a bigger swath of water. And the same thing with warming. You know, when it's warming, I could be in shallower water that's kind of off the main, you know, current. And it's saying 75 there and 61 out in the main river. Gotcha. Chris Williams, uh, he was going to ask how far are you away from uh, Iowa. Uh, ask Tim if he runs any charters, guide trips, please. Too close to me not to ask. Yeah, uh, you know, Chris, I used to do 
maybe a hundred eighty to about 120 guide trips a year but that was when I was 25 to 30 32 38 all the way up to like 45 and I could you know stay out till midnight and still make it to work the next day and you know just work my butt off and all that and I slept at boat ramps for weeks Nope. <laughs> there you go. You're back. Can't hear you though. Yeah, I. I there you I'm go. Little, I, You're I'm good. Gonna, I wouldn't say burnt out on that, but I have other things that you know make better money than guiding, especially with the way gas is right now. I mean, it takes a hundred dollars to fill my boat, and we'll go through through three quarters of a tank on just those live shows that you see. And yeah. a, a, a you know a guide trip is more than that usually. Uh, Dead Sea Pirates. Uh, yeah. Any any tips for bank fishermen fishing a reservoir? No, uh -oh. you're muted. Can't hear you, Kevin. For me. All right, he'll he'll come back in in just a second. Uh, I got a couple of questions. I'll get them in. Uh, so Charles, Chris, I'm not sure if you heard him the whole way. He said that, uh, you know, it's just too expensive for him right now. And, uh, you know, he's going to – he focuses on other things that he can make money at behind underwater thermometer. Well, thank you, Hogleg. I appreciate you coming in, man. There he is. I'm back. Back. So was it me or was it you? Because mine just sort of quit. Yeah, I think it was you that time. Okay. Uh, any any um, tips for bank fishermen on a reservoir? Yeah, look at maps. I mean, that's going to be your, your biggest thing. You're, you're going to have to use your catfish knowledge to try to get to. Because one thing about lake, when they're moving, they're moving. But most of the time, they're not moving. So you got to try to figure out where to ambush them. I mean, that's going to be your big, biggest success thing. Try, you know, as much as you can, if you're a lake fisherman from the bank, to have as long a rod as you can so your reach is bigger. You know, don't worry about snags. And a lot of times, if there's a ledge you can throw over and you're going to get snagged, that's the best place to throw. I mean, and some of those ledges are way out there. It's almost impossible to get your rigs back, uh, you know, but through the use of slinky weights and, you know, uh, certain, you know, fairly rounded circle hooks, you can do a little bit better than the old days when you had the big giant dumb coffee can and, the, you know, the five-bot bass hook that snagged on everything. So, I mean, it, it just – but, but – to, to have words of encouragement, sometimes a bank guy's got to lighten his line a little bit or buy something like a, a Garcia 7000, something with a pretty big school ratio that casts really well. Get something like a, a minimum 10 up to 12 to 14 foot rod that's not so heavy, you know, because I mean, you can buy a lot of rods uh, that are really heavy at that weight. But if you get something that's a little bit easier to cast and you can really sail that stuff around, your reach is huge, you know, at, for a bank guy. I mean, at uh, one time, I used to fish the bank a lot. So how does current affect water temperature? Um, the only way current really affects water temperature is that, A, it turns it over because it won't stratify as much. Like uh, if, if you do a, uh, let's just say it went right out to the middle of the Mississippi River right now, and it said 75 in 40 foot of water, it's most likely 75 at the bottom too, because there's a lot of upswelling and downswelling. Now we all know that when you swim in a river or a lake, there's warm and cold veins, and veins travel like little, like, we're, you know, like stand, stand in a lake, and all of a sudden... It's really nice and warm like bath water, and then there's a cold vein that hits you. So what causes that? That is basically because it's got a hydraulics to it. And so the hydraulics between the cold and the hot is, is a natural thing. But you got to look at it as an average. You know, it, it's pretty rare to have a river with current that is 75 on the top, even if it's 100 foot deep, and be very cold at the bottom. Right, because it's it's constantly it's got its own hydraulics. It's uh it's it's very much like wind. I mean wind because you've got cooler air and you've got warmer air. That's the only reason we have wind. Because it's it's constantly it's got its own hydraulics because uh 
you know, hot air is constantly rising, cool air is constantly falling, and so it's constantly mixing, causing all kinds of things. And it's, it's much like that, only a lot denser. And really, if air was a lot denser, we would swim instead of walk. You got a fan. Catfish heroes. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what. If you don't love Sean, something's wrong with you because I just love that guy. If you don't love both of you. Well, on that note, Tim, we all love you, man. We thank you. And uh, we thank you for coming on here and sharing your knowledge thanks, with thanks, us. Thanks for having me on. I, I'm just amazed by you know a lot of things that I learned on here, and I'm grateful to be a part of this Catholic community. I really am. And it, it, I, it's, I'm not just saying it. It's just great. You know, I, I enjoy your show. I enjoy a lot of people's stuff. I mean, I enjoy just the comments and people's chat stuff. And, and I, I, I'm still blown away that, you know, there's 100 and some or 130 or 150 people, you know, watching our stuff i mean it's dark it's dingy sometimes we don't talk we get dirty I mean, but we have a chance to see a 100 yeah. pound catfish that's true that's true and, and that's that's what i hope for and you guys are just down to earth people man like you just like you appreciate everyone that comes in there um and i i i I do, I do as well. So, like, I know what you're feeling. I just feel like I can relate with you guys. Like, everyone matters, and everyone watching, like, we really appreciate that. They do. You know, and like I said, and I'll keep saying it, never met a catfisherman I didn't like. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm going to pray us out, and, uh, you know, I, Tim, I don't expect you to say much out of this, but I am going to pray for you. Um, and, and your family. So uh, thank everybody for watching. And uh, I hope you hit the thumbs up before you leave. I hope you check out Epic Catfish's link in the in the description. Him and Catfish Heroes down there in the chat, they go out there and they they slay the monsters, guys. And they're just they're entertaining as well. So uh, here we go, guys. I'm going to pray it out. Uh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for another awesome night and a uh, Lord, I just lift you up and give you all the glory for everything that I'm able to do on this channel and uh, all the people that are in it that chose to spend their Wednesday night with us. Uh, Lord, I just appreciate it all. And I know you you are the mastermind behind it. And I don't take for granted that others struggle and they're hungry and they're at war. And, and, uh, and Lord, you're everywhere. So I know you're there as well, but you're also here tonight. I just thank you. And I want to lift up our brother Tim. Uh, Lord, we know he's still fighting uh, emotions and memories and all kinds of stuff. And uh, Lord, we just we we don't know. I don't know uh, how how much pain he's in. And uh, just that he'll come over here and and just share with us still, Lord, just as a testimony to how you're working in his life. And I just pray that you would, uh, Lord, he'll he'll never he'll never be done with it. But Lord, that you would just comfort his heart and just hold him and give him people and his family and his friends just to come around and and just make him feel warm and, and give him some uh, opportunity to you know ease the pain a little bit as much as can be and uh, we just thank you for that we just want to lift him up uh, lift him up every day we'll pray every day for him we just thank you for what you're going to do not only in his life but in all of our lives and uh as we go away our separate ways, Lord, we just pray that you keep us safe until we come back again. So in your name we pray. Amen. All right, man. Thank you so much, Tim. And uh, y'all make sure you check him out. Until next time, happy fishing.